Hello friends and welcome to my 2019 Halloween special. And as you probably saw from the thumbnail and the uh, the intro there, uh, the topic for this year's Halloween special is Lon Chaney Jr. But before we get into that, as tradition, we need to release Bela from his coffin. And Bela actually has gotten a few uh, additions this year. I can't remember if this was, if I had this last year or not, but Bela now has a nice black cape. And Bela now has his own tamper, which I am calling Renfield. And Renfield was a uh, kind gift from our dear friend Danny Shore. And I think that, uh, you know, Danny made this tamper. It fits the, uh, the aesthetic perfectly, and I think he would have been uh, glad to see it used in this way. So, we will wake Bela from his long rest with some haunted bookshop, and we will begin to talk about Lon Chaney Jr. Now, if you've been following me for a few years, you, you know I, I started this, uh, well this is the third in, in this series of Halloween videos. Uh, the first one I wanted to, I really just wanted to do something about Boris Karloff, because I like Karloff. Karloff is uh, one of my favorite uh, actors, certainly my favorite horror actor. And, you know, after I completed that, I thought, well, I'm going to have to do others. Um, and it made sense to me that I would want to do the three best-known universal horror stars. Uh, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and Lon Chaney Jr., now, I know there are people out there that are going to say, well, what about Lon Chaney? Yeah, you know, Lon Chaney Jr.'s dad. Uh, yes, Lon Chaney was an incredible star and, and, and certainly part of the Universal Horror family. But I wanted to stick to, uh, you know, post-silent film era. Um, st starting with, you know, the, the, the era that started with the release of Dracula in, I believe it was 1931, maybe 32. So, I, I was going to focus on those three, and Lugosi was first, I'm um, sorry, Karloff was first because he was my favorite. Lugosi was second because Cheney Jr. was going to be very difficult. Now I knew when I set out to do this that Lon Cheney was going to be difficult. The reason being that first off you can't talk about Lon Cheney Jr without talking about his father, Lon Chaney. So that immediately complicates the, uh, the, the, the storyline. And Lon Chaney Jr. was a remarkably prolific actor across multiple genres, so there was just no way that I could capture all of that in a reasonably length video. You know, I didn't want to turn this into a one-hour documentary. So I hope that what I did will meet with your approval. I hope that you enjoy it and uh, maybe learn something that you didn't know about Lon Chaney Jr. or about his films. And I hope that you have a very, very happy and spooky Halloween. Enjoy. February 10, 1906, in a small cabin in Oklahoma City, a baby boy came into the world. His parents were silent film legend-to-be Lon Chaney and his wife, Frances Cleveland Creighton Chaney, a well-known singer who went by the name of Cleva. The labor was difficult for Cleva, and the boy was born premature and lifeless. The doctor and the nurse, who happened to be Cleva's mother, Matilda, 
work to resuscitate the non-responsive infant, but to no avail. Then in a dramatic moment that would change the course of horror film history, Lon Chaney grabbed the lifeless child, ran out of the house, and submerged the boy's body in the icy waters of Belle Isle Lake. The cold shock was apparently enough to cause the child to start breathing, and thus began the life of Creighton Tull Chaney. The Chaneys traveled the vaudeville circuit, with young Creighton beginning to make appearances in his parents' acts at the age of six months. By the time the Chaneys had settled in California in 1910, the marriage of Lon and Cleva had begun to deteriorate. Cleva was just 17 when Lon was born, and the rigors of a life as a vaudeville star and young mother appeared to be too much for her to handle. She became highly erratic, and in 1913, after yet another heated argument with her husband in the wings of the Majestic Theater in downtown Los Angeles, Cleva attempted suicide. She drank a bottle of mercury bichloride, a highly toxic chemical that at the time was used to treat syphilis. Sadly, although she survived the attempt, the corrosive liquid destroyed her beautiful singing voice that she was best known for. The Cheneys divorced a year later, and Cleva willingly gave up the custody of their son. However, Lon struggled to provide a stable life for Creighton. The boy was sent to a foster home for children of divorce and disaster, and later was sent to live with his paternal grandparents, who were both deaf and mute. This was a formative experience for young Creighton, as he learned to mime and use sign language to communicate. This experience would shape him into the quiet and compassionate and introspective actor that he was to become. Lon Chaney began working as an actor at Universal Film, and finally was able to establish some financial security. He married Hazel Hastings, a longtime friend and one of Creighton's babysitters, and the couple were able to care for the boy once again. Creighton attended Los Feliz Grammar School, where he enjoyed his first stage success with a leading role in the school production of The Princess and the Pea. From that point on, Creighton grew up enjoying a relatively normal family life. Hazel and Lon remained happily married until Lon's untimely death in 1930 at the age of 47. Despite dying young, Lon encouraged his son Creighton to find a career path outside of Hollywood filmmaking. Lon did not want his son to have to go through the same rigorous ordeal that a life in Hollywood at the time uh, produced for a young actor. Despite that, Creighton could not help but absorb some of his father's lifestyle as he watched the man of a thousand faces rise to stardom. He would often watch his father apply his signature makeup and learn techniques of makeup that fans still argue about today, such as the method that Lon used to create the upturned nose of the Phantom in 1925's The Phantom of the Opera. However, Creighton did listen to what his father told him, and he worked hard. To avoid his father's shadow. Creighton attended business college and found a job working for a Los Angeles plumbing company. In 1928, he married the boss's daughter, Dorothy Hinckley, and the couple had two sons, Lon Ralph Cheney and Ronald Creighton Cheney. Life seemed to be well laid out for Creighton and his new family until tragedy struck in 1930. Lon Cheney, man of a thousand faces, a man who just may have been the greatest actor to have ever lived, passed away. He had battled pneumonia for the previous year, and when he had difficulty recovering, the doctors discovered that he was suffering from lung cancer. This, combined with an infection caused by inhaling artificial snow on a movie set, led to additional infections and complications, and he ultimately died from a throat hemorrhage at the young age of 47. Another shock soon befell Creighton after his father's death, when he discovered that his mother, Cleva, who he had believed to be dead, was actually very much alive. This, combined with the start of the Great Depression, threw Creighton off the track he was traveling, and he landed in a movie theater. Beginning in 1931, Creighton Cheney began working for RKO Studios and was in a long list of films, including 1932's Girl Crazy, 1933's Lucky Devils, and a modernized serial of The Three Musketeers starring John Wayne. 
Beginning in 1935, Creighton decided that he could not avoid his father's shadow any longer, and he began using the stage name Lon Chaney Jr. In 1937, Chaney signed a contract with 20th Century Fox and appeared in a long list of films, including Charlie Chan on Broadway and Submarine Patrol. Chaney appeared in over 50 films between 1931 and 1939, never receiving top billing and making just enough money to survive. He later said of this time, I had to do stunt work to live. I bulldogged steers, I fell off and got knocked off of cliffs, rode horses off precipices and into rivers, and drove prairie schooners up and down hills. This all started to change in 1939, when Cheney was cast as Lenny in Of Mice and Men. Previously, Cheney had played the part of Lenny Small, a seemingly gentle giant that could not control his own strength, in a stage production of Steinbeck's work. He desperately wanted the film role, and fought for it even after the producers had cast his friend, Broderick Crawford. Ultimately, Cheney won the role and played it to perfection. If you have not seen Of Mice and Men, go and watch it now. What you covering up there? Just my pup. Just my little old pup. He's dead. He was so little. I was just playing with him, and he made like he was going to bite me. And I made like I was going to smack him. And... and then he was dead. Cheney's performance demonstrates that he, like his father, was one of the greatest actors of his time, and perhaps of all time. Cheney made a few more films for various studios, most notably 1 million BC for United Artists. But it was not until 1941, after 10 years of mostly bit parts in every genre of film, that Cheney was cast in Universal's sci-fi horror thriller, Man Made Monster, a film that I find highly entertaining and worth watching. Cheney plays Big Dan McCormick, or Dynamo Dan the Electric Man, the sole survivor of an electric train crash that killed all the other passengers through electrocution. And Dan has seemed to develop a sort of immunity to electricity. A scientist played by Lionel Atwell takes advantage of Dan and turns him into an electrically controlled robot to do his bidding. Much of Lenny Small, and perhaps much of Lon Chaney Jr. himself, come through in this role. The success of man-made monsters led to a contract with Universal, a number of supporting roles, and ultimately a starring role as Larry Talbot in the 1941 film The Wolfman. On the one hand, this was the role that typecast Cheney as a horror star for the rest of his life. This is a bit unfortunate in general because he was such a good actor, and he had a much broader range. But for horror fans, this is a watershed moment which led to Cheney becoming synonymous with some of our favorite characters. The makeup for the Wolfman was developed by makeup legend Jack Pierce, and it involved rubber prosthetics and thousands of yak hairs, each applied separately, one at a time. The makeup took six hours to apply and three hours to remove. This led to quite an ordeal for Cheney. Despite the makeup woes, Cheney delivers a masterful performance as Larry Talbot. Talbot is the somewhat unwilling heir to the estate of Sir John Talbot, played by Claude Rains, who falls in love with a local girl named Gwen, played by Evelyn Angers, and winds up being bitten by a wolf that tries to attack Gwen. The wolf was, of course, a werewolf, and the curse is passed on to Talbot. Cheney plays the role of reluctant monster to perfection. In the role of Larry Talbot, we find bits of Lenny Small and Dan McCormick, guys that don't quite fit in their situation and are forced into doing things that they do not want to do. In the role of the Wolfman, Cheney gives a savage horror of a pure animal nature. The uncomfortable balance between these two sides of the same man are what makes this movie so enthralling and what led to Cheney being cast in a total of five Wolfman movies. In 1942, when Karloff declined the role, Cheney was cast to play the Frankenstein monster in The Ghost of Frankenstein. In the same year, Cheney played Karis the Mummy in The Mummy's Tomb, another role which Karloff had developed ten years earlier. A landmark film for Horace fans was 1943's Son of Dracula, in which Cheney was cast as the vampire count. 
I say landmark because this was the film in which Cheney became the only actor to ever have portrayed all four of the great universal monsters. The Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, and Dracula. Cheney had a long career after leaving Universal in 1946. He made over 90 films between 46 and 71, most of which were supporting roles. Cheney was typecast as a horror star, and those were the only starring roles he could get. We're focusing here on his horror career, but it must be emphasized that this was just a small part of his very large catalog of work. Cheney played the Wolfman in a total of four films between 1941 and 1945. As mentioned above, the first was the 1941 The Wolfman. He also starred in 1943's Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, 1944's The House of Frankenstein, and 1945's The House of Dracula. In 1942, Cheney first played the role of Karis the Mummy in The Mummy's Tomb, a role he would revisit in 1944's The Mummy's Ghost, and the same year in The Mummy's Curse. While these roles are often forgotten by fans in favor of the Wolfman movies, Cheney turned in a masterful performance as the mummy in all three films. Cheney also starred in a string of inner sanctum movies between 1943 and 1945, including roles in Calling Dr. Death, Weird Woman, Dead Man's Eyes, The Frozen Ghost, Strange Confessions, and Pillow of Death. In 1948, Cheney put on the Wolfman makeup and the persona of Larry Talbot for the last time in a feature-length film to play the role in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. This is an entertaining movie, yet seldom held up for its exemplary acting by the cast. However, I would argue that Cheney's acting abilities shine in this film. Sure, it has all the silly slapstick, but Lugosi and Cheney, not to mention Glenn Strange as the monster, raise this movie to a different level. The same year, Cheney was hospitalized for taking an overdose of sleeping pills. This sadly highlights the fact that there was a dark side to Cheney's life. On the outside, he appeared to be a kind and good-natured man with a successful career and a happy family life. In reality, he suffered from depression and alcoholism that would ultimately contribute to his death. Back in 1936, after nine years of marriage and two children, Cheney's first wife, Dorothy, divorced him, citing his excessive drinking and claiming that he was sullen. Cheney married Patsy Beck the following year, and the couple remained married until his death. In 1952, Cheney appeared on the television show Tales of Tomorrow to play in a live version of Frankenstein. Cheney played the monster, and according to legend, was quite drunk and unaware that the show was being broadcast live. He apparently believed that it was a rehearsal, and in a scene where he was supposed to be smashing furniture, he very carefully placed each piece down, unbroken, in order to save the prop workers the trouble of repairing the furniture for the live broadcast. Nonsense! We have work to do. Let's get our chair back where it Cheney continued to churn out films and television appearances through the 1950s and 1960s, appearing in a wide variety of genres. He did everything from playing Chinagook in 39 episodes of Hawkeye and the Last of the Mohicans, based on James Fenimore Cooper's stories, to episodes of Wagon Train, The Monkees, and an infamous episode of Route 66, with a few of his friends all in makeup. In 1957, Universal re-released its classic horror catalog, and Cheney found himself once again in demand as a horror actor for the baby boomers, and he once again was remarkably prolific. 
Cheney starred in movies like The Devil's Messenger and The Haunted Palace in the early 1960s. Then on to a string of films in 1964, including Witchcraft, Spider Baby, and The Face of the Screaming Werewolf, a very odd low-budget film starring Cheney as a mummified werewolf. Cheney's final horror film was in 1971's Dracula vs. Frankenstein, in which he played Groton, Dr. Frankenstein's mute henchman. By this point, Cheney was suffering from throat cancer and heart disease, brought on by his hard drinking and cigarette smoking. His voice was raspy and unrecognizable, and his face, disfigured by years of alcoholism, was nearly unrecognizable. Lon Chaney Jr. passed away on the 12th of July, 1973, at the age of 67. According to the New York Times, a long series of illness had put Mr. Chaney in and out of the hospital for the last year. He was released from San Clemente Hospital last April after surgery for cataracts and treatment for beriberi. Friends say that he had also suffered from liver problems and gout and had recently undergone acupuncture treatments to relieve pain. Cheney's dying wish was that his death not be publicized, and in accord with that, Patsy, his wife of 30 years, declined to disclose the cause of death or release the funeral plans. Cheney's body was donated for medical research. Lon Cheney Jr. is the third in the trio of Universal Horror Stars I set out the profile in these Halloween specials. For the previous two, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, I was able to end with stories of their pipe smoking days, favorite pipes, and tobaccos. Unfortunately, I cannot find much evidence that Lon Chaney Jr. ever smoked a pipe. In fact, I was only able to find one picture of him even holding a pipe, and we can only guess what sort of tobacco young Creighton might have enjoyed. Lon Chaney Jr. was a masterful actor and is responsible for some of the most enduring images we have of the golden age of Hollywood. He was also a quiet and very private man who worked to keep his personal life out of the papers, even unto death. As a result, much of what we know about his personal life is tragic. The story of his unstable mother, early death of his father, divorce, substance abuse, and chronic alcoholism all paint a very different picture than the public face that Cheney shared with us. Like many of his characters, Lon Cheney Jr. was a man of contradiction an outward appearance of kindness, strength, and confidence match with a tragic inner sadness. I can think of no better way to bid farewell to Creighton Tull Cheney than with Maria Ospinskaya's final words as the gypsy in 1941's The Wolfman, Lon Cheney Jr.'s first horror film success. was thorny through no fault of your own but as the rain enters the soil the river enters the sea so tears run to a predestined end your suffering is over now you will find peace for eternity